Um, so the title of my dissertation, um, as you can see, is Reviving Beatrice's Body in Dante's Divine Comedy, a Feminist Death Psychological Interpretation. Um, and Dennis has already told you where my obsession started with this, uh, which was in his epics class. Oops, too many. So um, the first thing I would like to do is offer my thank yous. Um, Dennis has been an amazing chair. Um, like he said, there were ups and downs and highs and lows and a lot of sideways going on. Um, and as well to Mary and Emily, the, the entire committee has really made this a joy um, when it could have been a slog. Um, so thank you so much for that. I really appreciate you heralding among, uh, me through the journey. Uh, my Pacifica cohort members, uh, thank you guys so much. Going through classes step by in lockstep with them um, and then doing the dissertation in lockstep with them has been um, an incredible support to me, so thank you. Uh, Mom, Joanne Harris, um, is always supportive of any crazy thing I decide to do, so thank you. Um, and then members of D3 and all of my E friends who are out there, thank you so much for all the support um, because I know I've been talking about this for a good long time. All right, so an overview of what I'm gonna go over today, um, of what was in the dissertation. I'm gonna talk about um, the concept of embodiment a little bit, um, because it was really important to Dante's work um, in the Vita Nuova and the Commedia. Uh, we're gonna talk about bodies in the Commedia and how Dante treats physical bodies. We're gonna talk about Beatrice's missing body, um, which is a really thorough lit review over the past couple hundred years. Uh, we're going to talk about how Beatrice's body in the Vita Nuova and the Commedia um, present themselves um, that has been overlooked. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about the relationship between the reader and the text and how that relates to both Beatrice and bodies. Okay. So epics capture the imagination and occupy significant space in the collective unconscious. Um, because of their impact and years of um, scholarly work of interpretation and criticism and teaching, we're made aware of the various images um, and themes that become part of society's collective knowledge. But when that happens, it's just as important to think about the themes and images that are obscured by what we actually pay attention to. Right? Um, so embodiment is a central theme in Dante's work. Um, and while critics um, and many interpretations focus on the spiritual side of his journey through um, hell and purgatory and paradise, um, the physical is really crucial to this epic. And so I'd like to lay down um, sort of a philosophical base for what my hermeneutic was for looking at the text. Um, and first is that I used um, a lot of the work of Merleau-Ponty. Um, who considers spirit and body as inextricable whole, which goes against the usual Cartesian dualism of mind versus body in philosophy that stretches back a long time, um, which historically also privileged the mind over the body. Merleau-Ponty comes in and explains how bodily lived experience is crucial to human perception um, and how we function. This flips the usual, the usual philosophical approach on its head um, by saying that the body is the natural center of the self and not the mind. So there is a feminist critique of Merleau-Ponty, which I think is really important to take into account as we talk about bodies. Um, the feminists agree with Merleau-Ponty up to a point, especially about the idea of philosophy historically having privileged mind over body. Um, and so Merleau-Ponty changes philosophy from the idea of I think to the idea of I can, um, which privileges, again, the function of the body and action above the passivity of the mind. Um, but the feminists say that this I can idea is really problematic because not all bodies are the same. Um, there's a critique that because the, philosoph the philosophized body is inherently, it's con they consider it neutral, but it's inherently male um, and able. The philosophized body, um, the word body itself is not neutral uh, because the body is under power influences from external norms and influences. Um, and feminism makes space for these other kinds of bodies that are not cisgendered, white, able males. Right? So feminists try to turn the focus from the neutral experiencing body to specific bodies whose experience has value. Right? And so this opens the door for us to explore women's bodies as having particular value. Right. Um, 
in a nod to Lacan, um, who's another philosopher, um, he has quite a bit going on, but I'm going to take a piece of it, which is that what language indicates um, or highlights one thing, it obscures other. Um, and so they say the signifier obstructs all but what it signifies. Um, so if I ask you to look at my dog Igor, um, you are looking at Igor, but then you are not looking at everything else, right, by sort of requirement. Um, and so I posit that historical and critical readings of Beatrice have been really focused on the representations of spirituality, um, which has obscured her body. Right. And so because I also look at this from a depth psychological perspective, um, we look at Jung. Now, depth psychology, as a brief explanation, explores the unconscious um, and transpersonal aspects of human experience, often through the study of dreams, um, complexes, archetypes, images, and that sort of thing. Um, it was founded by Jung, and it offers us a way to consider um, the importance of images, including their intentional presence and absence. Um, dreams, other inner psychic workings um, that relate to psychological development and health. All right. um, some important terms to think about are the idea of the collective unconscious, um, which can contribute images and psychic elements that have never been before been conscious in the individual, but instead are drawn um, from a commonly held sort of psychic reservoir. Um, and imagery and emotion follow certain patterns that we can refer to as archetypes, right? Um, I'd also like for us to consider the idea of a broader cultural complex, where um, we are steeped in a situation where um, there are unquestioned assumptions, and underlying beliefs held to be true by members of the society, including the power elite, um, especially them. Um, these unquestioned assumptions are long lived. They've lasted for many generations. Um, they create an unconscious anchoring of the present to the past, right? And this idea that what has always been true is true now because it has always been true, it's sort of a um, a cycle there. Um, and the, the cultural complex is a myth that the individual assimilates um, both consciously and unconsciously. Now, moving back to the body, focusing on the body does not involve abandoning the psyche or the interior. Um, we, rec we can recognize the corporeality um, of, of the, the world at the same time as we consider the impacts um, to the psyche in the conscious and unconscious forms. You can't separate psychic life um, from, um, from the body, really. Now, the feminist critique of Jung is broad, varied, and very long, um, so I'm going to take just a piece of it um, for the purposes of this presentation. Um, so Jung is accused um, of projecting his own cultural context, um, including all of his biases against women, um, his view of gender, his essentialism, essentialist view of women um, into his theorizing. And so feminists take um, quite a bit of issue with that. But postmodern feminism and Jung can actually come to some agreement um, in the idea first that the body is at least partly psychologically constructed um, and the idea that image and behavior are inextricably linked. Um, our images of possible behavior inform our actual actions and our actions in turn can alter our images. And so the feminist critique of both Merleau-Ponty and Jung is that it matters whose body we are talking about, right? And it matters what motions are made by that body. So that's what the frame that I want to use for talking about um, Beatrice in the Commedia. So bodies in the Commedia. Um, embodiment is a central theme in Dante's work. Um, something that's a crucial to understand to sort of walk into this is the idea of the airy body that Dante creates, which is where each soul collects around itself the trappings of the memory of its body and its senses, creating what Dante sees as what he calls shades, right? What we would call souls, but creating the situation where those souls have a sort of physicality, right? It is because of this airy body um, that the infernal and purgatorial souls can experience physical punishment. Um, it's important to remember that um, the way Dante frames it, the body is not inherently sinful, but the body accumulates the sin that is committed by the decisions of the soul, okay? So in terms of bodies in Inferno, um, corporeality is crucial. Um, the body is central to the suffering that we see um, in Inferno. Um, this suffering also creates an affect in the reader. 
right? Um, one of both mental and physical discomfort. The sensate nature of the reader means that the environment and punishments described are really viscerally absor absorbed um, by the reader. The physical suffering in Inferno is both unrelenting and eternal, um, which is going to come into play when we start talking about time, right? Um, the bodies in Inferno are always in motion. Um, you may remember the famous scene, for those of us who have read it or seen um, some plays, the famous scene of Paolo and Francesca in the whirlwind um, when Dante first gets into Inferno. Um, and you'll notice in reading this that infernal bodies um, are in motion, but they're moving in useless and hopeless configurations um, so that they never make actual progress, right? Um, there's constant physical exertion um, and pain, but it's without a purpose. Um, it's a type of hell on earth for those um, who read the text, and it makes things ultimately meaningless. Um, Dante forces us to consider what it is to be active with no purpose, um, what it does to the intensity of one's suffering, and the idea that without change, there's no real possibility for growth, right? And so this is a death in the psychological sense. You're caught in this useless motion that will never make progress anywhere. Um, and the natural state for humanity is to be in motion, um, to be activated towards a goal. Now, Dante's body in Inferno is um, very different. You have to remember that Dante actually retained his earthly body as he's moving through these spheres, right? And so for Dante, there is a constant triggering of physical responses from his body. Um, upon walking into hell, he weeps immediately. That's a physical response. Um, and it's a reminder of both his and the reader's embodiment. Um, there are visible differences between Dante and the shades. Um, despite the shades embodiment, Dante's differs in important ways. Um, he gets on the boat to cross the river Styx with the shades, and the boat actually sinks under his weight, which it doesn't do um, when the shades enter. Um, he moves what he touches. The hypocrites note the throbbing of his throat um, and the fact that he's a physical, a fully earthly physical being. Um, and the other thing about Dante's body in Inferno is that he has to exert a great deal of physical effort. Um, when he is walking through hell with Virgil, um, he has to climb up rocks. At one point he gets pushed by Virgil because he can't make it on his own. Um, and so we see that his body is, is quite a bit different from the eerie shades. Now bodies in purgatory um, are slightly different from the ones in Inferno. Um, and it's important to make a note that um, while they are also corporeal, right, they maintain their physicalness, um, embodiment is still the vehicle by which pain and suffering are inflicted, but it has a very different purpose. The wounding in Purgatorio is also a healing, um, and the souls there are driven by hope and not despair. Right? There's movement in Purgatorio in, in a purposeful way that there isn't in Inferno. Right? The souls are wending their way up the mountain of uh, Mount Purgatory, um, and so they're oriented upward. They also become physically lighter um, as they shed the sins at each level um, and move their way towards salvation. Um, there is actually a scene in which the angel um, at the entrance to purgatory flat out tells Dante, you do not look back, do not look back, right? Because the way in purgatory is always forward. Um, the purgative is actually productive in terms of the suffering. The pain of the body becomes redemptive in nature. Um, and there's a big difference between the scarcity and eternity of hell um, versus the hope and salvation of the suffering in purgatory, right? Um, there's a spiral movement in purgatory. They're not just moving up the mountain. They're actually moving in a clockwise manner up the mountain, up Mount Purgatory. Um, and in Jungian psychology, the spiral is a symbol of the unconscious and the inward journey. And it's the path towards understanding and making oneself whole, which is exactly what's happening as you read through um, purgatory. Now Dante's body in purgatory um, is earthly and physical. Hi. Um, still very earthly and physical in nature. He goes at the beginning of his journey in purgatory to embrace one of the shades and his arms move right through it. Um, he gets su surprised by the insubstantiality of it. Um, and it's so, it's almost though embraces are for the living, right? Um, his body cuts through the smoke at one level. He's blinded by smoke. These are all sort of physical reactions. He shares the penance of some of the um, penitent in purgatory 
in purgatory. Um, it's Odoriso that he starts to talk with who the shade is bearing a huge boulder on his back and is walking very crouched over to the earth. Um, and while Dante holds a conversation with him, Dante also becomes a penitent in that he bends over and sort of shares in the penance um, during that conversation with the shade. Um, there's a physical marking upon the body that happens in purgatory. Um, so Dante, for instance, is marked um, by the angel that marks all souls who carves seven Ps into their foreheads. It stands for peccati or sins. And as they work their way through Mount Purgatory, those Ps are healed and they disappear. Um, so Dante is also physically marked um, in his body. And the idea of time, whereas time is eternal in hell, Dante is measuring things in hours. Um, he actually measures things by the position of the sun. Um, and that's a luxury of the embodied. The purgatorial souls think of time in more hundreds of years when they think of time at all. Um, and there is no time in Inferno, it's eternal. Um, there's, it's gonna last forever exactly the way it is and there's no change. Now Dante's body and really interesting because when, you, when he gets to paradise, um, it's, the body does not experience bliss in the same way that the body was experiencing pain um, in the first two, first two levels. Instead, the work is to actually shed the body for a lighter soul, right? So um, they become increasingly disembodied as they get to the prime mover um, or God, um, which is how he refers to it. At the end of Paradiso, um, you may recall for those who have read it, Dante actually sees embodiment in the three circles um, with an image of man who is perhaps Christ, perhaps Christ at the center, um, which may reveal how the image of Christ and the image of mortals is one and the same, very physical in nature. Um, this complicates Dante's relationship with Beatrice. Um, as she both possesses a body, but also becomes, as they get closer to God, more and more radiant, which dilutes her airy body and becomes more spirit. Um, this opens the door um, for questioning Beatrice's physicality, which is what I want to do. Now we get to Beatrice. Oops, went the wrong way. Now we get to Beatrice, uh, which I knew you were all waiting for. So I'd like to talk about Beatrice and her body as it has, or as the case is, has not appeared in literary criticism over the past couple hundred years. Um, a thorough literature review reveals that she is treated in a number of ways, um, as an allegory, as a, fig as a figure, as a metaphor, as divinity. Um, and I'd like to take you through those, um, the literature on each of those so we can see how she has been presented um, to the cultural complex that, that we all live in. So first and foremost, she, is, um, she can be seen as an allegory for divine love. Um, she sends Virgil out to Dante to save Dante's soul out of compassion and love. Um, she can also be seen, as some critics note, as not an end unto herself, but a vehicle sent by the divine to assist Dante, right, to, to approach divine love. Um, as an allegory of divine wisdom, um, one critic noted um, that she has to be divine wisdom personified. Otherwise, Dante was just making time ogling another man's wife. Right? Um, Dante asks Beatrice questions, and in her wisdom, she gives him her verdicts of the recurring um, church errors that Dante thinks need to be solved in, in the real world. Um, and so her wisdom appears in, in that nature. Um, she also appears at one point wearing white, which some critics read as revealing her as um, clean at heart in terms of divine wisdom. Um, the embodiment of um, the transcendence of human reason. So Dante represents the human, right? Um, Virgil represents the epitome of human reason, right? And the art of poetry as, as he moves Dante through. Um, and then beyond the heights of human reason of Virgil comes Beatrice, right? And so her, she's moving towards the divine wisdom on the spectrum. And then there's some criticism that notes that wisdom is beauty, that argument can be made. Um, and as Beatrice grows lovelier and lovelier through their time um, in paradise, Dante grows wiser and wiser, right? And so that connection to divine wisdom. Some actually see Beatrice as a Christ figure. Um, and at one point, she appears in red clothing, which some critics say give her the state savior status. Um, 
she also appears in Paradiso in a role specifically forbidden to women um, by major theologians um, as a priest. She acts as a priest. She acts as a confessor um, and a teacher of theology. She actually corrects a number of saints um, that are in paradise, which is um, sort of a bold thing for Dante to have done um, in his text. Interestingly enough, when Beatrice comes um, into the picture, she comes in at the very end of Purgatory, right, of the Book of Purgatory. Um, and when she appears, she's heralded as the bride um, in the Song of Songs, as the church, right, in literary interpretation. But she also appears as the groom because Dante um, very deliberately actually uses masculine um, masculine gendered nouns and adjectives for her at the same time that he's recognizing her as a woman. So she, um, so she sort of encompasses both um, as, as what's going on. You'll note that only Beatrice and God are infallible in the Commedia. Even the saints get corrected by Beatrice. Um, she can be seen as what is divine in Dante's own soul. So she's the Christ in him. And you'll notice that she doesn't, in, the, in a reading of it, she never acquires the traits of the Virgin Mary, as we might expect um, as she moves through um, heaven with Dante. Um, she actually pull, pulls in some of the, the elements of Christ himself. Um, and so the, the final representation um, in terms of divine wisdom uh, and Christ figure is that um, she's described as a rising sun when she first appears. Um, which draws parallels between Dante's description of her in the Commedia and then descriptions of her in the advent of Christ by St. Bernard and Thomas Aquinas. Moving on, um, she can also be seen as the nexus between the earthly and the divine. She becomes an inflection point between the historical and the allegorical because she existed as a physical woman, as Beatrice Portinari. Um, she becomes the highest ideal of the feminine while also retaining human characteristics, right? She is both a historical figure and a figure of the mythopoetic imagination. Um, she retains both of herself in terms of earthly womanhood and celestial being, right? Um, her, she holds the fullness of both positions because Dante can't freeform invent Beatrice in the Commedia because she already existed in the Vita Nuova. So when we talk about Beatrice, she's always bringing this duality with her um, when, she, when she moves through. Um, as feminine divinity, um, Beatrice can actually be seen um, as becoming a crucial element of um, Christian salvation machinery herself, which essentially elevates her to the level of a Christian goddess. Um, she acts like a deity in her own right. She speaks to Dante as a deity would speak to um, a mortal. As an ideal woman, um, she's interpreted as the highest idealization of woman, where perfect love becomes almost religious, right? Um, we, can almost, we can almost read it as a perfect martyrdom. Uh, she, Dante was a poet of what was called the new style, or still nuovo, um, and they all possessed a mystical ideal woman that they, that they wrote to, a beloved. Um, and she can also be seen because of this as a product of courtly love. Right, in which all the focus oops, is on the poet and her existence is predicated on the needs of the poet. Um, so she is always serving, her presence is always centered on Dante. And then finally, the ideal woman's power is to make men into the best version of himself. And Beatrice actually takes this to, ex to the extreme and actually forges Dante's soul to be worthy uh, of heaven and God. And finally, in the literature, we can actually um, see her as an archetypal experience, right? She was not really of herself for Dante. Beatrice is really a constellation of images and emotions um, that are archetypal in their power and hold over Dante um, and in his writing. The other thing is that by keeping her image alive in his writing, um, he never has to deal with her death. Right? He never has to deal with her physical death because he keeps her image alive and never has to actually turn, make the turn and grieve physically um, for her. 
So Beatrice as a person with a body um, is forgotten and exchanged for this constellation of disembodied, um, if meaningful, images. The other thing is that if she was not archetypal, how would Virgil have recognized her, right? They didn't live in the same era. She had no fame of her own to speak of. And so the idea there is that she, um, she is a lady having meaning for all mankind. Um, so those are, those are the ways that Beatrice actually appears in the literature. Now, I would like to talk about the way that she does not appear in the literature, which is as an embodied um, person. Right? And so moving into the text with the understanding that previous critics haven't either consciously or unconsciously explored her that way, um, we can explore particular instances of her appearance in Dante's work. And so I'm going to start with how she appears in his Vita Nuova, which is when she was actually still alive. Um, at their first meeting, um, they're children. He sees her from afar, um, and he notices how she is adorned, and he comments on her bearing, right? And Lacan would note, um, just going back to Lacan from some of the first slides, that directing our attention to one thing necessarily conceals our attention for another, right? And so Beatrice's bearing can come to light and should be read as how she is holding her body in space, Right? Dante is attracted to a girl who moves her body with surety through the world. Right? Um, previous literary critics have spent their time debating what the color of her dress meant, and they never speak of her bearing. Right? We can also see this first meeting um, as, in depth psychological terms, an activation of an archetype for Dante, um, who has an overwhelming emotional reaction to her presence, right? He goes so far as to quote Homer and to say that she must be the daughter of a god, right? Um, Dante's proximity to her activates his psychic rec recognition of something greater than himself in her. Um, now, the next time they meet is actually nine years later. So Dante has a little bit of an obsession going on here. Right? And he, she gives him her first greeting. They meet on the street. Um, she's, she is um, flanked by two other women. They meet in the street. Um, Dante notices how her physical form is adorned. She's wearing white. Um, and she, how she comports herself, this time in company of the women. Um, and while previous scholars, again, have focused on the meaning of her pure white dress, there are books written on this, uh, and whether it indicates purity, charity, chastity, wisdom, any other manner of other virtues, um, none have commented on her comportment during this, during this um, meeting and how her body in space communicates with Dante through movement. And so looking at it from that postmodern feminist her hermeneutic, um, Beatrice greets Dante as she's walking down a street. So she's moving through space. Um, she's a woman's body already in motion before she meets Dante. Um, she's got purpose. She's got direction. And she remains in motion after she greets him. Right? It's a very simple hello. They don't stop and talk. Um, and so the motion of her body is only temporarily fixed on Dante um, when she shifts her eyes to him to greet him. Um, but her interaction with him is a temporary moment. Oops, sorry. Temporary moment and doesn't become a permanent part um, of her comportment. So encountering Dante doesn't actually impact her physical orbit at all. She keeps moving. Um, she's a force unto herself physically. Um, and Dante in his text allows Beatrice um, to conduct herself in a manner of power through the body in an an unusually autonomous way for the times. You know, we're talking about the 13th century. Um, and so her root as a woman is not shifted by, by, her appearance, by his appearance when she encounters him. Um, her only concession to him is a brief pause and hello. And I'll note that um, in this first greeting, death psychologically to be um, recognized by the archetypal image is a powerful experience. Um, and one that usually happens in dreams or other non-waking states. And so for Dante, this direct experience with, with the archetype um, is overwhelming. And it plummets him into his first vision, which is the next, the next bullet point. Um, in the next vision, some of you may remember who have read it, um, Dante falls into a vision where Beatrice is naked, but for a slim strip of cloth and being held in love's arms, right? Love is personified. Um, and Dante is watching this vision. Um, and she proceeds to um, have to eat a flaming heart um, that we can assume is Dante's that's being fed to her by this image of love. 
right? Now I want to point out that Beatrice, Beatrice's body, um, again, is naked minus, he's, he describes a very slim slip of cloth. Not one of the scholars and critics I encountered in my research ever mentioned her nakedness and how scandalous that might have been for the time. Um, their attention is actually solely on the meaning of the color of the cloth um, that, that covers her in this episode. Um, this is the only instance Dante writes where Beatrice's body is so physically on display. Um, but he downplays her nakedness and he only mentions it once um, in the description of the scene when it otherwise would have been quite remarkable. Um, and while the text glosses over this detail, we should, make, we should pay deep attention to it. Um, women's bodies are usually bounded by time and space and social norms that often restrict their movement. And so being naked, Beatrice is no longer bound by these mores anymore, right? Um, she's in the embrace of a second archetype, that of love, right? Um, where she becomes a powerful statement of a woman's body holding a direct link to emotional experience. Right. Um, she lies within an embrace. She's passive when she lies in love's embrace, indicating, um, indicating some kind of or equilibrium between herself and love. Um, and the eating of the flaming heart is the most physical experience we might imagine. She has to bite, she has to chew, she has to swallow, um, she has to digest. Um, so engaging in that engages the physical as well. And she, he notes that he, she eats hesitantly. Um, so she engages in the physical, but she doesn't physically overindulge in anything. Um, she's making him part of her own physical structure by eating his heart. And this kind of physical consumption, a heart wound, if, if you will, brings to the forefront the darker side of the feminine archetype, um, which can consume or devour the masculine. Beatrice also denies um, Dante her greeting um, at the point where he has pretended to have girlfriends in order to get attention from Beatrice. Um, and so she refuses to greet him in the street, um, communicated again through her physicality. She ignores him. She keeps walking. She moves her body away from him in space. Um, Death psychologically, this, this rejection is catastrophic to Dante. Um, the psychic energy of the archetype is withdrawn, um, but the feat of that is done through physical rejection. Finally, we see um, Beatrice and the Vita Nuova experiencing grief at the death of her father, um, and the report is that she is weeping piteously. Um, that's the report that Dante receives of her condition. Um, grieving is a deeply human and a deeply physical experience. It centers the body in relationship to others when we're vulnerable, vulnerable um, through loss. And death psychologically, it's noted as a vulnerable time and psychically active. But weeping, again, is a super physical act. Your breathing shudders in and out. Your shoulders might hunch. Um, your chest heaves. You're drawing breath. You've got tears. Um, and so, again, she's engaging with the physical. Now, Beatrice's body in the Commedia um, is interesting because she is shade and not shade. Um, when she appears, she is, um, the translation that I used says that she is regal and disdainful to, uh, upon her arrival and her sight of Dante. She berates him for falling off the path um, of the faithful, um, but she, the way she is holding her body in this regal and disdainful way is a physical communication through the body to Dante before she even speaks about her displeasure with him. Right? She holds herself erect in the same manner, and you can see that this, um, the language he uses for Beatrice's body here in the Commedia differs greatly from the language that he uses for a Beatrice that was much softer and gentler in the Vita Nuova. Um, in Purgatory and through Paradise, Beatrice often places Dante behind her body in order to physically shield him from some of the more radiant aspects that he's encountering that his human form cannot absorb. Right. Um, and so this becomes a significant pattern as they move through the end of the, um, the end of the epic. Now in Paradise, she is consistently characterized by her movement away from Dante, her physical bodily movement away from Dante. Um, she is constantly turning away from him. She's constantly reorienting them towards the holy. Um, she continually shifts herself physically from Dante back to the holy, turning um, away from him, reminding him physically that his attention is supposed to be on God and his love for God and not his love for Beatrice. 
right? Um, he draws at one point because of his ignorance, a sigh of pity out of her, which again is a very physical reaction to um, disappointment or exhaustion with somebody, right? You, you draw air deep into your lungs, you heave it back out. Um, at the end of the epic, when Beatrice's work is done and she's brought him all the way up through the levels of paradise, um, he notes that she has the bearing of a guide whose work is done. Um, and so we can note that um, such a bearing might include a loosening of the shoulders, um, a relaxation and lowering intensity of her stance, which had been regal and disdainful. Um, and so the last thing she does is turn away from him again and towards God and her rightful place um, on one of the thrones. Um, she smiles at him, but turns away, which is another, um, another example of her reminder that even though his love for her is both physical and beatified, he should still be striving for that love relationship with God and not her. All right, I want to take, pull us out of the Commedia just a little bit to talk about the relationship between reader and text that is really important. Um, there are consequences of the sharpening division of the physical and the spiritual self, right? Um, in a feminist death psychological reading, we can retrieve the physical and integrate it in ways in which we understand the text, right? Beatrice uses her body as a communicative device of agency throughout the epic. Um, a woman's body, not just her disembodied soul um, or ephemeral love, is, um, is of importance, right? Um, Beatrice's body serves to tether meaning back to the human, right? Because Dante's encounter with the divine has to be mediated in some way because he can't encounter it directly because the human in him just cannot absorb that kind of knowledge. So she's a mediatrix. Um, and so by denying her body, I would argue that we deny the body has meaning. And these are some of the consequences um, that, that we see from removing the body from our, um, our interpretation. Now, reader response theory um, is long established, um, and it posits an active relationship between the reader um, and the text that is created each time the reader encounters it and makes meaning from it, right? So the text does not necessarily have meaning in and of itself. The reader actually brings their own interpretations, their histories, their images, and is an active and current participation um, in reading. It's not a passive um, engagement. Right. Um, this makes it transformative. Literature becomes a powerful tool in the socialization process. Right. So I imagine that many of us um, actually read Inferno in high school or college. It's one of those sort of um, culturally relevant texts that many of us um, get get exposed to. Right. And we have the opportunity to change the meanings of a text if we can change or augment the knowledge um, and internal world of the reader. So if we can bring to consciousness new knowledge, new images, um, new sensitivities, the way a, a reader moves through the text will keep those in mind. Um, and so if we can encourage readers to be cognizant of women's bodies in a cultural context, we encourage readers to bring that knowledge with them to a text, which allows them to sort of excavate it in a different way. Um, and reader response theory also has certain exercises that you can engage in, and one of them is to actually become one of the characters in the text um, and act that out or write it out to see what it would feel like to be part of the text. Um, trying to envision them as new situations not in the text would confront them, um, which can lead to interesting insights into the characters and the text, which moves us into the idea of Jung's idea of active imagination exercise. So the goal of Jungian active imagination or the transcendent function um, is to bridge the gap between the unconscious and the conscious, right? Um, the, con the contents of the unconscious are translated into images, narrative, personifications, which ties us back to reader response theory. Um, and so this may have value in terms of an exercise for someone reading a text when a woman's body is present in whatever manner. Right. It creates an empathetic relationship um, between the reader and the body in the text. Um, 
and you can feel the importance of each movement and gesture if you come to the text this way. This offers us the opportunity to transform how we teach and learn texts like the Commedia. Um, reader response theory offers um, that opportunity for significant transformation when it comes to our understanding of how women's bodies actually function with agency in literature. Right. Um, and so new meanings may emerge when when en encountering um, texts this way. And so we can consider reading Beatrice's body, how we can be transformed through a new understanding um, of her as a character. And I know it may seem um, like a small thing to sort of pick and pick, pick at where she appears and how she uses her body. Um, but reading works in this mood really sheds light on interpreting her not only as a be beatific spiritual guide, uh, but as a physical being who consciously uses her body as a force to influence Dante and his journey, right? And so avenues for future work. Um, aside from new readings of the Vita Nuova, we can explore conscious acknowledgement of the erasure of women um, and the, their physical form in literature. In particular, I think of Penelope and the Odyssey. There's a new translation of the Odyssey, um, and the translator's name escapes me. I think it's Emily something. Um, but it's actually translated from a feminist viewpoint to look at the look at the language as she translated. And there are things that talk about like Penelope's strong hands, which have been left out of previous um, men's interpretation. Um, and so um, a feminist interpretation of that. Um, of that translation um, is an interesting project. We can talk about the bodies in Toni Morrison's Beloved. We can talk about women's bodies in Wuthering Heights and the Scarlet Letter. Um, it, it's sort of open to all of literature. Um, the idea is can we borrow from exercises both in the literary world from, um, from reader response theory and depth psychology's um, transcendent function to encourage deeper engagement with the text um, and with the body when reading. Which brings us to designing safe consciousness, ex consciousness raising exercises because engaging with the unconscious can be a dangerous proposition. Um, and then thinking about what professional development would look like for teachers who hold the canon, right? And sort of reify the cultural complex that we live in. Um, and that has been the work that I have done um, in short. Great. Yes. <laughs> Wonderful. Can, uh, can you hear me? I can. Yeah. That was just an extraordinary, um, I was going to say a, a summary, but it was much more than a summary. You, what I enjoyed most about your presentation is you brought the poem incarnately back into uh, the discussion into this defense. And um, that's not an easy task in and of itself. But then you went on and really laid out for all of us um, why the hermeneutic that you chose uh, is not only extremely valuable, but its um, permutations, as you listed uh, some of the uh, female uh, figures in literature, um, it's like you've opened up another genre, a kind of incarnational genre about how to understand uh, these classics of uh, literature. So it was just, it was just an amazing um, presentation. Uh, Thank college. you. Just Thank amazing. you so much. So now, Mary, I'd like to invite you, if you'd like to make an observation, pose a question to Colleen, whatever you like. Absolutely. Thank you, Dennis. Colleen, yes, I um, second all of Dennis's comments. It was really superb. Um, I feel as though, as he mentioned at the beginning, there's a, um, a mentoring connection between all of us and between the text itself. You know, Virgil is one of the quintessential mentors um, in our Western uh, imagination. Dennis has been my key mentor for at least the last decade. And what a joy you, now we're connected in that way, in this continuation of ideas. Um, so I can't stop thinking about the connection between your work over the last couple of years and the moment in time that we find ourselves in right now. 
as a collective, as a human, um, as humans on this planet, mm -hmm. all of us uh, in isolation now, um, hoping to um, survive um, physically, hoping that our livelihoods survive, um, protecting each other by staying home. Um, while we know that many of our uh, friends and neighbors are out um, doing those essential services um, in order to, um, to tend to us in so many ways. So a couple of things that you said, again, keep bringing me into the moment. Um, you mentioned that in purgatory, you, you don't look back. Dante was given that instruction. Um, you have to go through. And I think we're in a purgatorial moment right now that could last some time, like purgatory itself. Um, there will be pressure to move on, mm -hmm. uh, but we can't. We can't move on until the time is right. We're going to have to move through this purgatory together. And that movement is spiral as you alluded to. And I know that's something that's so important to Dennis's work, that spiral movement of psyche, of, um, of nature. And then the, um, the third thing would be, you mentioned a little later in your talk that um, denying the body has tremendous meaning. When that becomes our canon, our imagined order, to borrow the words of um, the young scholar Yuval Noah, Noah Harari, uh, mm -hmm. who's an incredible book, Sapiens, uh, that's so depth psychological, but without really referencing those uh, depth psychological um, ancestors that have informed all of our work. These imagined orders are filled with denial. Mm -hmm particularly the feminine body, our connection to nature, um, that we are, we have dominion over nature, and that dominion is generally seen in the body of a, um, a straight white male who has um, been the dominant subject throughout Western history. So my question to you, thinking about this moment in time as we're all gathered here, your years of work, going so deeply into this epic. What are your thoughts on what connections are you making between this work and what it could offer us now sequestered um, in our sanctuaries, in our purgatories? That's a really good question. Um, I think that, so there are certain um, segments of the population that think about the body a lot thinking particularly of the disabled and the chronically ill, right, um, who have this awareness with them all the time. Um, and then when the pandemic came, um, many of, um, at least the folks that I know who fall into those populations, um, were much better equipped um, to handle some of the isolation because they had already experienced it to handle some of the fear because it was a fear that they have already carried for a very long time. Um, and, but what has been interesting to me, particularly after, after doing this research, is how suddenly the rest of the population understands or is starting to try to understand the body, um, both in terms of their own and keeping it safe and protected, um, and in relation to the other who is suddenly dangerous, right? Um, and so, there's a there's a humanity problem that happens here right we can become more human by understanding the way that bodies function the way we exist physically um but there's that danger in pushing away the rest of humanity um while you are understanding the inner um the inner workings of the physical and so this this has really brought to light for me um, in the pandemic our relationship to the body culturally Right. And so suddenly we are looking to the chronically ill and the disabled for knowledge on how to function. Um, you know, we are looking to cancer patients who were having chemo, who had to stay away from people for their own immune, immune systems. Um, 
you know, sake. Um, we are now looking to the weak, what we, what you could call have been the, um, viewed as the weaker parts of society um, that are normally left out, that are normally um, marginalized. Marginalized, yes. Excellent word. Um, invisible, just like Beatrice, made invisible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And so I think that um, that has really hit, hit close to home. Yeah, that, thank you. And I think um, once you get a little rest from this uh, effort that you've put into today, I would love to see you write about this. Um, get some articles out, get some blog posts, um, Pacifica's Alumni Association, the uh, alumni website has been accepting wonderful contributions from okay. um, alums, and I would, I think you could make some tremendous um, connections that would help us all understand this, this moment. Thank you, Colleen. Superb. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you. And um, while, you while you were presenting, I called Emily, hoping that I could at least hold the phone and she could listen to your uh, presentation. Yeah. Um, and uh, uh, there was no answer. So I'll track what happened there. But I'm just. I'm here, Dennis. Oh, you are. <laughs> yeah, Sorry. I've been here the whole time. <laughs> Oh, I didn't realize that. Well, beautiful. So, Emily, I'd <laughs> like to invite you to make an observation or pose a question to Colleen, please. Thank you so much. Yeah, I saw your call, and I thought maybe you were just calling me accidentally. The, the, I got, the email was sent to the wrong email address, so I got in just as we started. So. Oh, beautiful. I'm so yeah. happy to hear that. Okay. Yeah, I've been the whole time. So, Colleen, that was just... Your, your project has been fascinating um, and uh, you've given me so many ideas about my own teaching and research. It just, you should be very proud of the work that you've done. It's just, it's beautiful. Thank you so much. You're welcome. It has been a pleasure. Um, my question is a little bit like Mary's um, in terms of thinking about the present day, but then also a little bit different. So as you were, as I've been reading your uh, your chapters, and as I was listening to your talk, I was wondering what you're thinking about how uh, your project fits into the context of uh, feminist studies or gender studies in the current moment of like the Me Too movement, you know, we see where we think about the body and that sort of that Beatrice experiences of being empowered, but then also disempowered at the same time, you know, where that might fit into sort of today's conversation. Um, it's really interesting um, that you bring that up because I actually mentioned the Me Too movement um, in one of my chapters, you probably remember that, um, of the dissertation in terms of the way that we have historically, at least in the West, right, the way that we have historically pushed women's bodies into the unconscious, right, into the not visible, into the obscured, um, which causes, um, which causes eruptions occasionally, right? When, when these issues come into consciousness violently because we haven't assimilated them. Um, and so something like the Me Too movement is a surprise to the culture where the feminist, feminine power has sort of come out um, in a, um, you could say a violent way, right? Because it's a demand, it's not a please help us, it's a no, you need to make this happen. Um, and so, in terms of the relationship of the work to the moment, um, I hope that um, this can become sort of a, um, as it evolves, sort of a, the teaching of literature Me Too moment. In terms of um, those of us who teach the literature really coming back to the idea of the body and how it is used and how it is presented by the author um, and how in particular feminine bodies are used, presented, manipulated by the author um, into causing certain meaning. Um, because I think that we are really accustomed to having our heroes, right, who are male. Um, and we know their stories really well, and we know that they took the sword out of the stone. We know that, you know, he used his sword to get into, um, into the shades. Um, but we don't have as many stories of women in this way. Uh, it's really interesting because in literature, um, I follow young adult literature quite a bit because they've got some 
fantasy um, series that go on. And you're seeing more and more that it's heroines and it's young women that people are now writing into the literature with these kind of heroic powers. Um, and so I think it's sort of a ripe moment for us to review the way that we teach literature um, and, and re-examine our assumptions about it. Absolutely, and I, uh, I don't know, in, in these situations, I can't, when I think about uh, these issues, I just can't help uh, think about Hermione and Harry Potter and how <laughs> she's <laughs> one of the unknown heroes. <laughs> she's the one who did all the work. <laughs> <laughs> she's the smart one who actually takes notes, right? Yeah. Well, thank you so much. It, it, it's just, it's a wonderful project. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure working with you. Oh, and Emily, just as I just feel so good that you've been here for the whole thing, which I, I didn't know, but it's not important. That I is, it's out. important that you were here. Yes. <laughs> so I, so Colleen, one question came up for me, and I was jotting some notes down as you spoke. Um, but I think I'm going to stay with the question that I wrote out on your folder for my file uh, as I was just kind of skimming through and getting your, your work um, back into my imagination. But I also um, stopped video for a moment to go and fetch this book, which I'm reading now. It's called How Literature Plays With Our Brain. And the subtitle is The Neuroscience of Reading and Art. Ooh. It's uh, fairly recent, I think maybe 2017, no, a, a little older, 2013, by Paul Armstrong. Listening to you today, though, I thought, maybe, <laughs> maybe you have a companion volume in you <laughs> off of the dissertation, how literature plays with the body of the reader. Mm. I mean, I could see a whole phenomenology of embodiment, um, you know, discussed uh, through mimesis, so the way the bodies of literary figures affect our own embodiment as, as readers. So, mm -hmm. you know, I just wanted you to know, and, and the audience, I wanted you to know about this book. But here's the question, and I'm going to read it off of the folder so I get it right. And I think it's in the ballpark of uh, both Mary and Emily's um, interests. So here's how I phrase it. And you say as much or as little as you'd like to, because it's, it's kind of a personal question to you. Okay. How has writing about Beatrice influenced your own self-identity as a woman, as a teacher, as a student and made you aware of perhaps several themes in your own life story that were activated in some way. Uh, I'm so glad you brought up Jung's active imagination because I think that's the real way to read these works is through a kind of active imagination where one's own unconscious is uh, prodded and probed a little bit and, and asked to come forward. Mm -hmm. So, that's, that, that's, that's where I am with your work right now. Thank you. That's a really good question. Um, so, I started this exploration with a real consciousness. I was very sick at the time when I started, um, if you remember. And so, I had a really interesting connection with my own body in terms of chronic illness at the time um, and trying to understand how I could force it to function for me. Um, and so that the relationship between that and the text has grown a little bit in that I'm more careful to think about my body more often um, and how I physically react to things, how um, when I am aggravated or irritated, um, I used to just take that out on whoever was around. And now I think, am I hungry? Am I thirsty? Am I in pain? Um, and try to sort of sift through the physical things first um, to try and figure out if that's what's sparking um, things. 
Um, as a student, uh, I will say that it, it has had me reading um, other texts differently and paying much more attention to how the author uses bodies, even if they didn't intend to communicate something through that. I think that something unconscious from the author um, moves through that. As a teacher, um, I haven't taught literature in a long time, but when I talk about it um, with folks, um, I do try to bring up the female characters um, that are in it. Like, for instance, there, um, so there's some argument that can be made that in Moby Dick, um, which is all men all throughout, um, that the ship can be seen as a female character throughout, throughout the book. Um, and so it's led to some really interesting interpretations um, for me uh, when I'm reading. Um, but the, I think the longest lasting and the most impactful um, the most impactful part of the work has been really becoming conscious of how I use my body um, or how my body uses me in certain cases um, and what, what meaning that has behind it. Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, here, you know, thank you for that. No, that's, that's, uh, and I'm glad that you were willing to bring up, your own illness as very much a part of the of the whole program of yeah. writing this and uh, researching it and so forth so uh, let me folks let me just uh, make a comment to Emily uh, and Emily we're just kind of doing this publicly I talked to Mary if when we finish because now we're going to open I'm going to open it up to the audience for about 10 or 10 or 12 minutes because I want to finish the ritual of, uh, of Colleen's uh, being here and all of you uh, joining it. But I thought instead of us trying to confer off stage, which is kind of a crazy thing to do because I think we all know where we're gonna go with her, with uh, Colleen, that maybe each of us says something to her at the end is a kind of confirmation of her passing the defense. And if that works for you, Emily, and uh, I'd mentioned it to Mary, then that's, that's how we can handle it. After that, um, I see that there's quite a few folks present. Um, I don't know if, uh, if uh, maybe I need to check in with Santos about people continuing if they'd like to, but as, a, as the chair and as committee, we want to complete the ritual of the defense which doesn't mean stopping the conversation, although at that point, maybe people uh, drop out or stay on. So that's the game plan. So with that, having said that, I'd like to open it up um, to uh, the audience. Observation, question, and I'll be kind of watching the clock to bring it down 10 to 15 minutes. Okay, let me stop there. I have a question. Yeah. Yes. Um, I, because I haven't read the literature you were referring to when you were talking about Beatrix, Beatrix's body um, in Dante's vision of her naked with a strip of cloth. Um, <laughs> I thought that was really interesting. And you even said when you're talking about it, you mentioned that she was unbound from her her clothing, and for me, that's a real key word because I work with that in my dissertation and the binding issue mm. of binding. And so I'm wondering if um, how you kind of read that, um, if you do, since it is a vision, I'm assuming it's, it was a vision of her, so it's a, mm -hmm. a, there's an unconscious dreamlike element. Mm -hmm. If what that might mean as far as the unconscious, you know, what it's trying to communicate to him about her, about that that binding or unbinding, if it's binding her or unbinding her, or what you might think about that. Um, I'm going to speculate on that one. Um, and I wonder if, um, because the only time he has seen her is in polite society, right, um, until he's thrown into the vision, and I wonder if... Um, because she is becoming more and more archetypal for him, she's becoming less bound to the human trappings of things, like 
um, particularly all of the clothing that they were wearing at the time um, that was probably heavy and constricting. Um, and so it makes me think of that, um, that it moves her from her pure humanity into the realm of image for him. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I see that Dylan, uh, because it's showing up on the screen here, uh, had raised his hand. So Dylan, would you like to go ahead? Yeah, yeah, I'd love to. Um, so I had a question um, that relates to sort of what you concluded with a little bit. Um, you spoke about almost using a reader response um, and Jungian uh, act of imagination and, and the transcendent function as well to sort of promote a different kind of reading of literature where it pertains to the female body. Mm -hmm. uh, and I guess my question is, do, is there any difference with how that applies to Dante, a man writing about a woman or writing a female character um, that was, as you've pointed out very well today, a real figure as well as a um, character. Um, and something like Beloved or some of the other examples you used, I guess, I guess another way to put it would be, is this more about a correction for male projection in authorship or male reader reading and interpretation over the exegesis over centuries in the case of Dante. Um, so yeah, if you could speak to that. Yeah, um, I don't think they're mutually exclusive. Um, I think that this kind of, um, the described kind of exercise um, can apply to anything written by a male author uh, because I think there are different bodily ways of knowing things. Um, and men have one way because they live in a male body, um, female body. Um, and so reading it from trying to draw out what that experience might be um, or the, the mysteries and how the male author tried to communicate the female body. Um, I think it's important for male readers to be exposed to this kind of thing because um, like we live in a patriarchal society, right? And these are the folks who create the norms. These are the folks who create um, the power structures that we live under right now. Um, and so I think there's, a, there's an important there, but I think it's just as important to explore um, the women's body as written by, by female authors, right? Because I threw Toni Morrison's Beloved in there. Um, there is, it comes back to the feminist critique of Merleau-Ponty that um, particular bodies are important too. Right, not just the idea of the female body, but a particular female body, and I think we can also we can return to works by authors of either sex um, and see how particular bodies are treated and interpreted. Yeah, thank you. Great, thank you. I see too that uh, I'm sorry the names aren't there. Two participants raised their hand. Would one of you uh, go ahead? Uh, I, I don't have your name, but uh, a, at least acknowledging your hand is up. Oh, I think I can bring them up. Okay. Stop share. Here we go. And participants, I can see who raised their hand. Dylan can put his hand down. Robin. Hello, Good. that was fantastic. Good. I think this is the first time in my life I've wanted to read Dante's Inferno or anything <laughs> else. Um, I was thinking when you were talking about um, male critics sort of paying more attention to Beatrice's um, covering than her body. Um, I immediately thought of Manet's Olympia with um, everyone talking about the cat and everything around that body and sort of leaving the black woman who's centered in the painting out. Mm. And so what kept coming up for me here is you've really offered us a really beautiful way of seeing othered bodies more broadly. Um, not just gendered bodies, but racialized bodies yeah. and um, disabled bodies. All of those kinds of things kept coming up. And I was really fascinated by this idea of absence of the body and um, when it is not absence mm. um, and the presence of it. And also um, what your work is doing in 
in terms of forcing other bodies um, out of metaphor. Mm. It means that they're real and you have to do something with them. So um, I wanted to echo what your committee said about um, publishing something like this. Oh. I think it will help um, particularly people who do not see themselves in canonical literature mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. find a presence for themselves. Yeah. Um, I was absolutely fascinated by what you were saying, but more than that, I just started taking notes about ways of looking mm -hmm. at yeah. other kinds of things. Um, Dante has mm -hmm. always felt like something that just did not belong to me. Mm -hmm. And then, and now suddenly it feels like, yeah, I could read that. Mm -hmm. So Great. congratulations. Thank you so much. Thank you, Robin. And oh, Colleen, I'll, I'll defer to you if, if you want to see who else uh, wants to comment. Yeah, and you don't have to raise your hand. You can just feel free to, to blurt out. Yes, yes. Steve says in the chat, he, came, he kept coming back to bodies in transition, tr like trans. Yes. Um, I think that's a really interesting um, yes. connection because, because of the way Beatrice's body functions as both <clears throat> human and ethereal, right? And she sort of trains mm -hmm. along the spectrum throughout um, Purgatory and Paradiso. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. You know, Colleen, um, I just remember that as I was reading, there were several times in your chapters where, and I think I made comments about this, where I just kept thinking about Ariel in, uh, in Shakespeare's um, The Tempest. Mm -hmm. uh, that his character, which is you know, referred to with the pronoun his, but is supposed to be ungendered or kind of a, a transitional, you know, air and water and light. I just thinking of that constantly when I was reading your chapters. And I'm probably also because I was teaching it at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I just, uh, I agree with, with the last comment. I, I think about the trans and transitional part a lot between this. I think there's a lot there you might, you might explore. That's my, my hope is that folks who end up hearing about or reading the dissertation, you know, as often as that can happen, <laughs> um, will actually go back to their favorite books because there is, um, in the dissertation I talk about this a little bit, uh, we all usually have a book or books that we return back to time after time, right? Because the more we learn about ourselves and the world, we bring that back to the book with us. And so we get new readings out of it every time. Um, I would really love for people to hear who hear about this work to go back to their most beloved works and consider um, bodies and the female body and the way it functions in the book that they already love and have sort of invested themselves in. Yeah, yeah, beautiful, wonderful idea. Others. Uh, Kirsten wants to know when it's going to be published. She needs to quote me in her dissertation. You can actually quote other people's dissertations. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I can, I can get it. you the text. <laughs> yeah, do it. Well, you know, while we're at a, at a kind of pause, um, let's, let's uh, kind of have the committee just uh, open in public. Each say, um, each say maybe a, not a final word, but a word on the on the presentation and the work, and we bring the ritual of the defense um, uh, to a close. So, uh, Emily, would you like to begin? Sure, I'd be happy to. Thank you. Um, I, you know, I I don't I really don't say this very often because I don't get to work with graduate students very often. Right. Um, but your project and your presentation have been one of the most uh, interesting, um, well-researched, well-written, and uh, just beautiful projects to be a part of. And I just, you should feel very proud. Um, and um, like I said, you've affected the way, you know, I've read other texts, the way I've thought about teaching. It's just a beautiful project. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks.
Thank you for that, Emily. And Mary, please. Yeah, I just, I keep um, thinking back, like the memories of this project, because we all have been on it, this pilgrimage together for a couple of years. Uh, Dennis, even longer, because he got to know you during your three years of classwork. Mm -hmm. I met you once you started, you had already started writing, you were pretty much into it when we, um, we met. But it has been just a delight. Um, you are a, um, an excellent scholar and sensitive thinker, writer, uh, passionate. So I, I would like to see you now use your other voices. Now that we've seen what you can do with the scholar voice, um, and get the dissertation out. Let's see you translate some of this into your other voices. Um, hmm. Take out some of the academic and make it very, um, very compelling for the engaged person in the general public. Um, get it out there, and we'll help you. Thank and you. We can. Yes. No. Absolutely. And. You know, you, you haven't um, only pushed the Dante scholarship uh, forward, but you've really bent its trajectory in some really important ways with the way, because I, I, I hear two dissertations. I hear the work on Beatrice, but I also, and, and I'm not alone here, um, discern that you know, the, the way that reading is taught really needs a, 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 a major overhaul uh, where students are asked to find the hidden meanings and, and that egocentric kind of brain-centered way of being present to the work. But you've brought in the affective and the incarnational and while Wolfgang Eser and others with reader response in 1981, 82, 83, when reader response theory was the thing in English departments across the country, um, then it died out. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you, co you continue to work this through the phenomenology of Merleau-Ponty and, and others, but also through your own embodiment, um, it's going, to, it's going to gather energy again by means of you. So what I heard from Emily and uh, Mary, and I concur, is that we are all in agreement that not only did you, did you pass, but you passed with, uh, with honors. <laughs> and so to the audience, I want to say, I'd like to present to you Dr. Colleen Harris. So, Colleen. <laughs> hey, thank you so much. Feel free to unmute yourself so she can hear you. Yes, unmute, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 It was just Congratulations, Colleen. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. Thank you all so much. Oh my God, you're going to make me cry. <laughs> Wow, what a beautiful, you make the whole myth program in Pacifica proud. Colleen. Thank you. Oh, so true. It means a great deal to me. Thank you. So great job, Colleen. Yeah. Yay, thanks, Mom. <laughs> and Mom. Congratulations. Good job, Mom. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you All right, everybody. All right, I'm going to stop recording.